welcome. Uh, yeah, welcome. The message is called Seeing, Seeing is Believing. And uh, the original title was True Repentance, Real Faith. So before we do, we begin, you can enter the prayer I was praying. Father, in Jesus' name, my ears are open, my heart is open. I receive your Holy Spirit. I exalt Jesus and want to lift you up. And Father, for myself now, as I speak your word, I pray that you will uh, sway the conversation by your Holy Spirit. I surrender and submit to you, Lord Jesus, and count it a privilege. Amen. So bless the Lord. I'll just dive in and we'll see where we go. Ah, I've already remembered what we'll do when I dive in, I'll go somewhere else. But I once asked a very awkward question to a leader. I wasn't being horrible. I said, what is the way forward for a believer? What, what is our direction, you know? And, I, you know, we've entered salvation. We have a relationship with Jesus. He is the door, the one door into the narrow path that leads to life. Jesus is the door. So, but we've entered that. Thank God for that. But what do we pursue? Where does our passion lie? What is the way forward for a believer? So I asked that awkward question. He felt awkward. I felt awkward. And we didn't really answer it, but it was a heart cry. Uh, this fits in with this. I will say at the outset that the only way to receive more from God is by dialogue, talking to him. It must become an ongoing cry from the heart to know God more. We have to ask, Holy Spirit, I see a glimpse of something glorious. Show me more, Lord, in Jesus' name. We must put in words our requests to God in prayer. It helps us realize what we are after and it establishes our hearts in the way forward. So I'll just say it again. Ask, uh, you know, Jesus will be pleased to answer you, sometimes mysteriously. You won't hear him necessarily audibly speak, but if you commit to him, he will lead. I will go on a bit more and read this. I believe of, of a, a grasp of this one factor will help us in our direction forward. In Ephesians 3, 8, the apostle says, To me, who am the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And uh, I like his attitude. I, he felt like the least of all the saints, which is lovely to have a leader in your midst who feels that you are more important than himself. But he, he said, I, 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 by God's ordination, I should preach among the nations the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now I said, if the, the, the riches of Christ are unsearchable, it tells me that no, pursuing God, to know Christ more fully, is an endless pursuit. It is an unsearchable, limitless depth to know Christ. Jesus Christ is unsearchable. And I'll just go on a bit more. A glorious obsession of knowing Christ more fully is the direction that sustains our passion for life, real life. A fascination, even a glorious obsession of the person of God revealed in Christ is the direction forward for every believer. 
I do not hear God saying, don't go overboard, you need to calm down, do you? He has invited us to know him. There's many scriptures that talk about knowing God, increasing in knowledge of God. And it, it isn't knowing about God, it's knowing the person of God. There's a big difference. I've voiced that a few times to, uh, to people in conversation. Uh, you know, when I read the Bible, I'm talking to a person. I'm not reading for information. I'm not reading to win a debate. I'm talking to God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'm talking to them, and I have a Bible in the hand, and I'm, I'm reading a verse. Sometimes it's, uh, it, you can only read a verse or two because he is interacting. He is breaking in and speaking to your heart, which is a beautiful way to live. It's a way of peace. I'll say, I'll keep going with these notes. We were created to worship and love God. That's what your DNA is, spiritually speaking. You were created to worship and love God. If you're off of that track, you will be despairing. You will be sh uh, shortchanged of the life God has ordained for human beings. We were created to worship. To live what you were created to be and all things will find their rightful place. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. All these necessary daily things will find their rightful place in your life. So my original title for this message was True Repentance, Real Faith. I will not call uh, labor the call in repentance of sorrow and mourning for sin, although that's valid. I will speak of repentance in seeing. Repentance is seeing. And secondly, I will not labor the typical explanation of faith, which often leaves us, us with the burden of somehow producing faith, manufacturing faith, or the burden of you should have more faith. My context will be seeing and all will become clear. Now I'm going to leave the notes now and just share a few things. Uh, in my recent trip, as I referred to my holiday, I might have to close this message after this because it will get longer and the rest is wonderful. I must uh, talk about simply seeing uh, repentance, true repentance, real faith is seeing. So I'll come back to that point and leave the other three pages maybe. But on my trip, God was speaking to me in dream, dream languages to, to let me know what I was dealing with. and um, But before I get into the dream language, let me just say something. A very well-known leader, international speaker, leader, said, we have the custom and tradition of gathering around a sermon, and it is time to gather around the presence of God. Now, that wasn't a fanciful idea in his head. I believe it was a directive and a mandate from the heart of Almighty God. And that making his presence the focus, the central thing, the presence of God. Jesus said, I will be in the midst of you. To me, it is a dreadful insult to expect Jesus to be there and just be silent while we do our programs, our sermons, our this and that. So that to me is a directive from the heart of God 
to focus, center around the presence. It's much more honoring. It's much more a reality. I talk about the in Christ reality. If you're dealing with the literal glory of God, that was the celebrated factor of the Old Testament. When the glory departed, it was because they had grieved him away and, and they'd gone their own way. So to have the glory of God near you, in your midst, dwelling in your midst, makes everything really good in your life. It brings you peace on an individual level. If you will plumb into the unsearchable riches of Christ, get that Bible, but talk to the person. Make sure you're reading the Bible in the presence of God. And if you don't yet know him, try and uh, call your heart to revere his presence. He is very worthy. He is almighty God, limitless in every way. And we should revere him, have a reverent fear of almighty God, not a foreboding, uh, whatever that word is, fear, a phobic fear, but it, it's an honor. It's like honoring a guest. If, if one of my favorite people ever visits, which they don't, <laughs> if they would, I would honor them. I would welcome them. I would be so glad that they were here. My whole focus was be, would be on them. I would cook for them and feed them and all those things. I would honor their presence. And that's just a human favorite people, you know. But God, make him your favorite people. Now, uh, I will, I'll come back to that, seeing true repentance, real faith. But first of all, I'll tell you about some of the dream language. Um, I saw at one point a lady, and over her eyes were sugared uh, slices of fruit. Over her eyes, over her mouth, over her ears. And I, I just thought, what am I seeing? And I actually just went about what I was doing in the day. But I had, I'd had that dream. And I now interpret that as a blinding power. I believe it was pronouncements. Maybe their parents' dad was involved in secret societies. And one of the things they do is pronounce things over their families. Now, pronouncements from authority figures are curses. So this lady had been blinded. The fact that it was fruit, sugared, sugared fruit, is like the falsity the blindness, keep, keep the mouth shut, the ears shut, the eyes shut, but with a sugar-coated sort of uh, vision on life, take on life. And uh, there are other consequences, and, and that's just one. So you can take that or leave it, if as you like. The next is very interesting. It, in the streets, I met an old uh, uh, acquaintance I knew, and uh, if he's watching, I'm not trying to pick on him. I'm, uh, God was very uh, revealing in this. And I wanted to kind of be on his side. He had found a kind of way of dealing with life. And he had uh, many sort of um, equations of, of thinking that were bringing him peace, he said. And he talked about deep meditations and stuff like that. Now I was saying, wow, that language uh, is, is, I use the same language. But I did say, but if Jesus was in there, you would be, uh, you know, sorted. Because that, you know, he's talk, talked even about the attitude of gratitude. I've heard Christians talk about that. So they've borrowed all these themes. He's in deep meditation, not with God, but he thinks it's God. He even calls it God, I think, the, the being up there, that kind of thing. Now, I was just trying to be kind of agreeable and encourage him. And I, I mentioned Jesus should be in there, and he really should. But uh, I just thought, well, that's good. Uh, hopefully, you know, he's warmed 
to my friendship and he'll ponder what I said. Now in the night, I'm caught up in a spirit and, and this is how I describe it the next day to myself. It was an impersonal force. Now, I was being caught up in this impersonal force. Now, the, the, the invitation or like the reasoning of that power that I was being caught up was to deal with demons. What a twisted little subtle lie, huh? It was to deal with problems. So I was being drawn up into this power, very powerful. I could feel the power, but it wasn't the holy power. Now I had, because of the grace of God and Christ in me, I had, even in the dream, this rising up to pull out of that thing. And I pulled out of this cloud of an un impersonal force and power, and I pulled out of it. And even in the dream, I shook, shook it off. And I, I thought, you, you horrible thing, you know, get away. And I think I woke and did some more of that thinking, thinking what, how awful, what deception. Now I get the impression that perhaps that person I know was meditating and thinking on me or God was just simply saying how real and powerful the deception is. I, we know that anyway. The devil masquerades as an angel of light. So he comes to deceive and people think, ah, a nice angel of light. And the Bible says he masquerades, pretends, puts on a mask to be, look like an angel of light, to deceive. That's another second dream. What was the third one? Ah, uh, what was the third one? Uh, well, anyway, enough. That was heavy enough. That was heavy enough. I think the third one was pretty cool, but uh, we'll see. Lord, I did commit it to you. Uh, what I did, I was seeing, and I, I saw some other things, and even this morning, uh, and nothing to do with the holiday, I'm somewhere else now, I was going to visit somewhere, and God gave me a dream, and I saw what I saw when I got there, and I saw details. God has a way of showing little details in the dream that touch your heart, and and make you see certain things the way God sees them. So we'll say all that and, and we'll leave the third dream, whatever that was. I'm sure it was good. And get back to the seeing is believing. Now I was, I've got many things, but I'm, I'm going to just turn to one, one of the scriptures. I recorded it's Acts 1919 because this fits in. Acts 19.19 19 says this, Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burnt them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, I'm going to say a bit about that. I think you would agree that this verse tells us that that was true repentance. That's the other title, true repentance, real faith. That repentance, turn of heart, cost them financially. Uh, some say that 50,000 pieces of silver, if you remember, Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, about 2,000 pounds, some say. So that would make 50,000 pieces of silver, about three million dollars or pounds you choose. Three million. So God was moving. The apostles were there. They were sharing, preaching. There were miracles and healings, signs and wonders. And the people flocked to the message. They flocked to the person of Christ who was being preached, the risen Christ. And they, they saw Seeing is believing. They saw that the practicing of magic, sorcery, witchcraft, and all these false practices, even the one I referred to in the dream, had no part in the following 
of Jesus Christ. No part. And, and as we're talking about his presence, his presence is offended by the occult symbolisms that we have. Some people have them in their homes, occult symbols on the wall. And they think, they don't think. But I think, I wonder, do you know why your life is so estranged and, and, and cut off from the beauty of knowing God. Now, there's loads more. I'll recap maybe. Seeing is believing. I believe there's one more verse that springs to mind I've got here. Jesus said to the religious people, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, he was talking to religious leaders when he said, I am he, that he knew, and they knew, because they wanted to kill him afterwards, he knew he was saying he was the promised Messiah. He is the Son of God, God who became flesh and dwell among us. He knew. He knew what the scripture said. He knew what they had read with their head, but their heart had not received it. And Jesus said a very strong thing, and it's not just to religious people, religious leaders. Jesus said, if, if you do not believe I am he, then you will die in your sins. Now, again, if you see that dying in your sins is pretty serious, then you might do something about it. But if... There's other verses I talk about. There, there's a scripture that talks about a veil is over the minds and eyes of those who are under the law, the Old Testament covenant. But the veil is lifted when they turn to Christ. Again, a veil is blinding them from seeing. And when we turn to Christ, our eyes are open. There's another lovely verse. I wonder what that was. Uh, oh, yeah, I know. Um, I love, and I've used this before, I'll try and wrap up on that. I've, got, I've, got, I've turned to the last page, we've missed some. Oh, thank God, they say. Uh, 1 John 5, 11, he used this before. John's wording in this, he says, I think I did this last time, I went back to verse 2, because John's writing said, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. That's verse 2. Verse 11 of John, John, 1 John, this is not John's gospel, it's, this is the first epistle. He wrote three epistles as well as John, John's gospel. In the first epistle, chapter 5, 11, he says, this is our testimony. So this is what he was testifying. He said, it, this was the, te the testimony that God has given us, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Now I've said, please get this. The revelation that the Holy Spirit is breathing through John as he wrote. It's a revelation. The wording is coming from revelation, uh, formulated in English or Greek words that we now have in English. The word is not saying eternal life is what we get when we go to heaven. He is saying that the eternal life has been given to us and this eternal life is in his Son. Now I've said it, if you are in the Son of God, if you are in Christ, then God's design is that the eternal life is manifest and revealed in you. How much I think God's answer would be, as he might have said when I used it earlier, God is not saying, oh, don't go too overboard. God is saying, I give without measure. And the only thing that's holding it back is you. God is giving eternal life in his son. Get that as well. 
It's not about eternal life when you get to heaven. It's a quality of life. It's the power of his resurrection life. And God wants that manifest in you. Now, I've been reminded of a very uh, powerful thing. <laughs> Bring it back again now. It's just drifted. Um, hallelujah, hallelujah. Please bring that back because it just floated back and then it almost disappeared. Ah, yes, thank you. There's a lovely verse in Romans 3 and it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A lot of preachers preach that and beat you about sin. The actual passage is talking about mainly about the righteousness that God gives us. Uh, and it, it's talking about righteousness of faith. You are made righteous through coming to Jesus. Jesus comes into your heart and he washes you. You are made righteous. Then it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now I'll leave you with this. Seeing as believing, we without Christ had fallen short of the glory of God. Coming into Christ, I believe that veil is a continuous thing. The revelation of who Jesus is, the 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 increase of the knowledge of God is a continuum. So the the glory of God we have fallen from. We've fallen short of the glory. Think now, see now what that glory could look like if it was restored in your life. All have sinned and fallen short, lacking of the glory of God. Now, seeing how much of the glory of God the eternal life of God can be manifest in your life, being a container of eternal life. Remember, God created us in his image and likeness. We were created to be worshippers of God, lovers of God. We were created in the image and likeness of God, filled with the fullness of the glory of God. Then a colossal fall hit mankind and they fell from the glory. Now in Christ, God's mandate is to restore the glory of God that was lost. Now this is why that uh, well-known leader in saying that in tradition and habit we have gathered around a ser sermon it is time to gather around the presence of God. Now I tell you, in the presence of God, people will see more of what you're trying to labor and beat them with. They will see more in an instant in the presence of God than you can do in a year of preaching sermons. If it's real, now a good leader a powerful leader is one who has a vision, who is connected to God in a real life way, a special way, really. Not that it's just for him. It, the invitation is everyone can come into this depth of a special relationship. But a good leader, a strong leader, is one who has a vision. And that vision is really about the presence of God. And he will not compromise that vision. That's a good leader, a strong leader. And hopefully he has a vision of the presence of the glory of God. Hopefully he has an awesome reverential fear of the glory of God. And he wants the glory of God, the presence of God, to be revealed so that the people in that place will see Jesus. He doesn't want to be seen. He's like the apostle, least of the saints. He wants Christ to be lifted up, glorified in the midst. He wants Jesus, who is in the midst of it, to speak clearly, powerfully, with direction and give us life direction because these are the days to know him in a special way the unsearchable riches of Christ I tell you I talked about that glorious obsession of Christ is a good thing God will not say don't go overboard 
if you will develop that, it's, it's a great discipline to wake up in the morning with those groggy thoughts sometimes and say, groggy thoughts, get away from me. We're going to talk to God. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to think of his greatness. We're going to read his word and we're going to seek his presence. And if, he, if it was a groggy morning, he might be feeling, you, your feeling of his presence might be distant and you can do something about that. Now, if you live in that kind of intensity and glory and, and priority, then you will begin to have one seriously good life. It is a discipline. Many thoughts, many things bombard us from every sometimes well-meaning soul speaking the worldly wisdom when we need the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the wonderful counsel, and that's what the Bible says of the Holy Spirit. He is the wonderful counselor, and he will counsel us, speak to our hearts, give us dream language, teach us to interpret them, and, and just understand them, not be overwhelmed by them, and you know, oh, God wouldn't use sugar candied, uh, you know, fruit, he would use something much more, what? <laughs> you know, God uses things that speak to our hearts. We have to discern because, uh, you know, there's all sorts of stuff out there. But uh, this has gone on long uh, and, this, and we didn't, as we never do, uh, get to the uh, central bit of the message. But there's been some good stuff and we thank God for leading this message and uh, if we make worship his presence his glory and pursue him his unsearchable riches just put away those other things burn those books and make the presence of christ not knowledge about him but knowledge of him as a person a friend and a special guest you will have a life that you will never regret and you will walk into eternity and Jesus will be there saying, well done, you did well to stay the course and fight all those crazy thinkings that were bombarding you. Enter into the joy of the Lord, my servant. Amen.